it's time for us to check back in with Louisa in Mountain Path and see what happens next. If you've missed any of the previous readings, you can look in the description below for a playlist. This chapter of the book is set on a day much like it is in southern Appalachia today. It is dreary and rainy and there is a little airish, a bit airish. It's kind of cool outside. So that's the kind of day uh, that we find in this chapter of Mountain Path. It was September and near the last of summer. Rain, as if in warning of the winter snow and cold to come, had fallen steadily all day out of an even gray sky. And one day the earth seemed to have slipped from summer into fall, and now, instead of being blue and green and yellow, with sky and leaves and goldenrod as yesterday, was all over and even gray, with the poplar leaves shining white-gray and the pine needles dark and blurred with rain. Rye and Pete and Teacher made the school and shut the door against the rainy cold and wished for a little fire, but there was no kindling wood. The children were cheerful enough, and when their lessons were said, worked at the blackboard or begged teacher for stories. Teacher told them gladly enough. She was lonesome, and even the sound of her own voice was better than the sad monotony of the rain. The little room was dreary, damp, and filled with a gray light which seemed to have no kinship with the sun, but to emanate rather from the weeping pine needles and the glistening poplar leaves. Sometime during the afternoon, the rain ceased with no thinning of the cloud overhead and leaving a heavy stillness in the room. Louisa wished the children were noisy laughing children like others she had known and would talk or even romp a bit and break the silence. But as always, they were very quiet as they had been taught to be both at home and in school. Sometimes at first she had been troubled by their silence and wondered if it did not come from a feeling of restraint while in her presence. As she grew to know them and their parents better, she learned that their stillness was a part of them. They were not a boisterous people with much loud laughter and easy talk, but forever quiet and soft speaking, mostly serious as if the whole world were some sacred place they walked through. It was past time for afternoon recess, but partly because the rain had kept them in so closely indoors all day, and mostly because there was nothing else to do, Louisa told the children they might take advantage of the slackening and play outside for a time. Pete went gladly and built a lake with waterfalls in the muddy road, but Rye said the mud was too cold and that she would rather stay inside with Teacher and draw a big picture on the blackboard. It would be the biggest picture she could make, she said, and pulled one of the backless resuscitation benches against the wall and stood on it so as to be able to reach the top of the board. Louisa went to stand by a window and watch Pete in the road and listened to water trickle down the ridges and drip from the eaves. She wished the day were over and it was time to sit at the closing of the night and watch the fire in Corey's step stove and tend supper and beetle while the baby's mothers milked. She looked at Pete with overalls rolled to his knees, ankle deep in the yellow mud and sand, while he squatted and painstakingly dredged mud from the, his lake and laid it on the sides. She wondered if the cold mud would not be bad for him, and for a moment thought to tap on the window and call him away. But he seemed so absorbed in his work that she had no will to do it. She saw him stop his play and, still squatting, tip his head backward and stare up into the low clouds as if he heard something there. He raised himself slowly, like an old man deep in thought, and stood, his small hands all yellow and dripping with mud and water, and looked about him, down toward the church, and up the road, and at the hills and trees on all sides. He looked frightened, she thought, and wondered at his fright until she heard the faint sound the child heard. She forgot everything for a moment, then except the distant sobbing notes of a violin that seemed to come from the earth or nowhere or be but some sadder, deeper note of the rain that was beginning again in thin, misty drops. She remembered Rye and turned and looked toward the dim corner of the room where she worked, hoping to see her busy and mindful of nothing. But she stood, like Pete, too still, her mouth open with her pale, lank hair straggling unnoticed into her eyes, her whole body tightened by something stronger than fear, a kind of expectant waiting for some monster to come silently through the door and seat himself in the room. 
The violin cried again, and rice chalk slipped from her fingers. She and teacher looked at each other. The rain sounds queer today, Louisa said. The voice did not seem to be her own. It sounded frightened, and she was not frightened by a strange sound. Teacher's voice had broken the spell for Rye. She could move and speak now. She sprang from the bench, and her bare feet padded over the floor. It's Davy Cow's fiddle, she said, and went hatless and coatless into the rain and down the muddy road with Pete after her, his pale curls bobbing in the mist. When they were gone, Louisa did not move from the window. She rubbed her wrist and felt their coldness and the quivering of her nostrils and something like ice water slipping through her hair and down her back. Still, she was not frightened. She told herself that several times while the coldness crept into her chest and throat and her stomach hardened and tightened with it. Drunk or crazy or a criminal, Davy Cow was flesh and blood like other men and the fiddle music he made was but sound like other sound. Strange that Rye should run. It was she who went before teacher when an angry cow or hog stood in the path. Rye had killed a rattlesnake only two weeks back. When the cows wandered far, it was always she who went for them and brought them home in the dark, unafraid of the wild cats or snakes or the ghosts and witches that were said to walk on Kinder's Mountain. Now she heard a fiddle, so faint it might have been but the rain, and ran away. Violin music wavered into the room again, coming more distinctly than before, as if, with a little encouragement, it might grow into a tune. Louisa tried to swallow something that seemed risen in her throat. Failing, she went for her raincoat and beret hanging on a nail by the door. She locked the door, forcing herself to take time and struggle with the old key and the rusty lock as she always did. She would not go straight home, she told herself, but walk around a bit so that it could not be said that Cow Valley teacher had been panicked by what she thought was the sound of a fiddle. She walked down the road and hearing nothing, though she stopped each few steps to tilt her face into the rain and listen as Pete had done, her fright dissolved somewhat into curiosity. She reached the church and heard the sound again. Here it did not sound so far away, and much of its eerie, in unhuman quality was lost. For the first time, it seemed to come from definite direction instead of from the air itself. The direction, however, was not reassuring. If her ears were true, somebody played a fiddle on the little hill across the road from the church house, a lonesome hill, the children said, where ivy and spruce trees grew, and under the low cliffs were chips of flint from Indian arrowheads. One noon, when there were several children at school, she had suggested that they all walk up and explore the place. The children had shaken their heads. Nobody went there. There were folks that said they had seen things there. A man had got drunk and frozen to death in a rock house there a long time back. And anyway, Lee Buck didn't own all the hill. Part of it belonged to the upper valley. Thinking of such things, Louisa knew that the sensible thing for her to do was to walk on home and tell Corey what the children had doubtless already told her, that she had heard Davy Cow with his fiddle. If he were crazy, as she supposed he was, and had escaped from some institution and found his way into Cow Valley again, Lee Buck and Chris and Hayes could hunt him and do with him as they thought best. If she had only questioned Corey, she would know now. Supposing he were not crazy but an escaped criminal, hunted and wanted as Chris was wanted, afraid to go home, afraid to be seen, crying with his fiddle up there in the rain for someone to come to him. She took a dozen steps into the heavy undergrowth of the hillside before she remembered that Rye ran away. Rye would not be frightened of a man who had killed a man. She would be afraid of the insane, the criminally insane, maybe. She stopped and half thought to take off her raincoat, a cream-colored uh, gabardine that showed too plainly against dark ivy leaves and spruce needles. She heard the fiddle again, near and plainly above her now, on the side of the hill toward the Lee Buck Cow Farm. Somebody was up there, hoping to be heard in this end of the valley, and not in the other. She would go, but cautiously. 
She did not want to come on whoever it was from below, but if possible, get above and look down and see and take no chance of being seen unless she wished it. She skirted the hill, climbing gradually so that when she reached the summit, she could look down on the Cow Valley side, knowing she had not yet been seen by any who might be on that side. The top of the hill was small, flat like a ridge top, with its edges falling away in low sandstone bluffs, rimmed with close-growing ivy and laurel and huckleberry bush. She crawled into the densest thicket she could find and waited to hear the sound again, a little anxious for its coming so that she might know the man was not too near her, but where she hoped he was. He could have moved and played the fiddle on some other part of the hill, and she would not have heard while walking on the other side. She waited for what seemed a long time. The rain was coming on more steadily, making a heavy patter on the ivy leaves. The rainy gloom had deepened with the lengthening of the day and the dark foliage of the trees about until for Louisa, the hill seemed someplace shut off in a world of fog and twilight. And she, for the first time, was really afraid and wished for nothing better than to sit at Corey's with Beetle on her knees and watch bars of red light from the cook stove play over the floor. She heard the sound not long after, ghostly in the rain, and seeming to come from the ground under her. She remembered that the children had spoken of rock houses on the hill and thought she might be sitting on the top of one. She crawled through the ivy bush until she could see the top of a pine tree and knew that the edge of the bluff was just before her. From care not to show herself, she lay flat and peered over the edge of the bluff down into a somewhat open space where tall trees grew among large sandstones. She lay waiting and the violin came again, this time unmistakably from under the rock. She wished the man would come out so that she might look at him. She lay gathering courage to call his name. Fear tightened her throat so that her voice was shriller than she would have it be when she tried to call softly, Oh, Davy Cal! The violin music, not a tune, but always the same few notes, stopped. She called again, louder than before, her voice gone all out of control and high and shrill. Oh, Davy Cal! She heard a sound as if someone scrambling rapidly over loose stones. Almost immediately, a tall, stoop-shouldered man, dressed in ragged, faded overalls and carrying a violin, stepped from under the cliff and stood looking cautiously about him. He, too, looked up into the sky so that she saw his face and was thankful for the close screen of the ivy bush. It was an ill face, bloodshot gray eyes set under an unkept black hair, and neither young nor old, but not that of a crazy man, she thought. He looked frightened or drunk and uncertain whether to go away or play the fiddle again, putting it once to his chin and then taking it away. He had not heard rightly, she decided. If she did not do something, he might go away without ever going home. She thought of old crazy Elgie. He should go to her and take the fiddle with him. Whatever he had done, she reasoned, he had no cause to hurt her if she only called to him. In any case, he could not quickly find a way up the bluff. She noiselessly raised herself and stood half hidden in the ivy. A moment of panic gripped her, and she wished again her raincoat were not so white. But she quickly summoned her and called to him her little greeting. Oh, Davy Cow, they want you to come home. The man whirled, looked once toward where she stood, and then heedless of stones or briars or fallen logs, went with great frightened leaps over the hillside. She did not want him to go away. Anger and disappointment gave power to her voice, and she called after him, Your mother wants the fiddle! He ran the faster, flinging fiddle and bow from him as though they burned his hands. She stood watching until he was lost among the trees, not keeping his way toward Lower Cow Valley, but turning and running in the direction of the upper end. When he had gone, she felt weak and a little disappointed and sat and rolled a cigarette from Bull Durham in her raincoat pocket and thought what she should do. She could go down and pick up the fiddle and tell Lee Buck and Corey of what she had done. 
She should have stayed away and not meddled. In spite of the appearance, the man was insane and frightened of any strange voice. Now there would be no finding him, gone as he was to the other end where the cowmen could not go. He might run all night through the woods. She shivered a little and got up and looked for a way over the bluff that would lead her straight home where she would go and take the fiddle and tell her tale. She found a ledge on that side low enough to jump over and walk to where the bow and fiddle lay. She took them up and saw the four miniature faces carved upon the tuning pegs and wished that she might go that night through the rain and carry it to Aunt Elgie. Once one string was broken, she thought that she would get a good string from Lee Buck, who had a fiddle too. She was out of the trees and hurrying down the road, anxious not to wet the fiddle in the rain, when from a tangle of brush along the rail fence below the road, someone called, Teacher, come here. She recognized the voice as belonging to Chris, but could not see him. She struggled through blackberry briars to the fence and saw him, then, half hidden in the black oak bush. You better come over here, he said, and reached and pulled her with rough quickness over the rail fence. She saw that he stood hatless and coatless in the rain, his shoes and overalls splashed with sand and mud as if he might have been running through the fields. Has anything happened? Is somebody... That fiddle he said, and his breath came short so that she knew he had been running. She had almost forgotten the violin she carried half hidden under her raincoat. It's Aunt Elgie's all right, but Davy Cow ran away. He is insane, isn't he? Chris stared at her. Davy Cow? He's dead. Been buried in Cow Graveyard six years, didn't you know? No, but a, a man played it. I saw him. Chris looked weary, disgusted like a tired teacher with an ignorant child. Corey come to the barn to tell me and Lee Buck what you and the youngins had heard. I was afraid you'd go looking like the time you went to look in the cave. I don't believe in ghosts. The man ran away, she said, unable to understand anything except that Chris was worried and one... Once more, she had done something she should not have done. Chris frowned and looked at the violin. Tall man with black hair and dirty gray eyes, I reckon. Yes, do you know him? No, but them Barnett's all look alike. You better give me that thing to me so I can hide it while you go on in. Can't I take it to Aunt Elgie then? Teacher, if you went walking into Aunt Elgie's with that and Lee Buck knowed what we know, they'd maybe be more dead than Davy Cow. The Barnett's killed him? Yes, he was killed a little yan side of the school. It was in the night and he was coming home from a singing. They couldn't find his fiddle. Lee Buck and Hayes went to look in a day or two, but it was gone. That man I saw has had it all this time and... And ain't Elgie wanting it so? Him or some of his kin? Give it to me, teacher, and get on in for Lee Buck starts a hunting. She handed the violin to him and followed as he walked quickly down into the corn. Why did the man play it? She asked. It's hard to say, he answered, pausing again after first making certain that they could not be seen from the house. He was maybe drunk and wanting to brag and let people down here know he had it, and maybe he wanted to scare the woman and youngins by making them think it was a ghost fiddle, a warning that somebody was to die. Was that why Rye was so scared? I reckon so. Somebody in these parts is always a telling about warnings and signs and a hearing ghost music. She remembered Samantha T. Maybe the man knows he is going to do something and thought it would be a good joke to frighten people here first. If anything's done, Lee Buck will do it. Maybe they would try to get somebody to come in for you. That wouldn't matter, he said, and pulled a blade from the yellow and corn and looked at it. Teacher, you better go on now and act like you'd heard a ghost. But will you take it to Aunt Elgie? He frowned again. Uh, maybe I could slip it in so people would think it come by itself. Right now, I'd better get it hid. And he was gone, swinging away through the corn. 
Lee Buck and Corey and their children were standing about the cook stove when she went into the kitchen. From the porch, she had heard their talk, a kind of arguing it seemed to be between the man and woman. When she walked in, they fell silent and looked at her, their faces grave and troubled as Chris's was. Lee Buck spoke first. Well, teacher, did you hear choir noises like the youngins? She felt them all watching her, Corey hoping that she would say one thing and Lee Buck another. Uh, it, it wasn't so queer, she began. It was just, well, just like any other violin, only it, it didn't play a tune. I, I guess it was Davy Cow. It was so sweet, like ghost music. No one moved or spoke. Corey was frying sow belly for supper. Louisa watched her turn one piece over and over while the other smoked for turning. A hickory ember popped from the stove and lay unheeded, burning a hole in the floor. Beetle gave a kind of smothered cry. Louisa looked at Rye and saw that she was clutching the child as one would a pillow in a nightmare. She could hear Lee Buck's heavy breathing and an unnoticed hound dog's pad pad over the floor. Corey took the half raw pieces of meat she had been turning and laid it on a platter. A ghost fiddle in the rain is a mighty bad warning, she said. Lee Buck's breath came heavily. Twarn't no haint. If and it had been yesterday, stead of six years back since we put the boy away. Louisa choked so that she could hardly get the words out. Uh, ghosts often come after a long time. You're right, teacher, Corey said. It was a ghost fiddle a giving a warning like the one my grandma heard, heard back in the old days. A warning, maybe, but give by no haint, Lee Buck said, and clenched and unclenched his big hands deep in the pockets of his overalls. Corey looked at him. Them up there wouldn't come to that. They may be mean, but not low enough to brag with a dead boy's fiddle they must have took from his dead body and... Teacher ain't wanting to hear no sitch, Lee Buck said. He added softly, I wished I knew. That one would never play another fiddle. And neither would ye, Corey said, and turned her back on them all and wiped her eyes with her apron. Louisa went out of the kitchen and across the porch and down the spring path. She carried no water bucket and did not know that her beret was in her hand instead of on her head and rain fell into her hair. If only there were not so many things to remember. Samantha T's words about Chris and those who would do him harm, the hardness of Lee Buck's voice and the gray-eyed man in the ragged overalls. Lee Buck would kill him if he knew, but Chris didn't care. Her thoughts had carried her to the spring house, built in the mouth of a little cave. She felt tired and frightened still, and leaned against the rough stones of the house and listened to the rush of water far back in the cave. She heard steps and looked around. It's me, Chris said, and came and stood beside her. He looked gentler now, less troubled, almost gay, she thought. We've about scared you to death, teacher, I reckon, he said. I put the fiddle away where Lee Buck won't come across it, and when this quiets down a little, I'll slip it to Aunt Elgie. Don't take it so, he went on when she said nothing. If it wasn't so serious, it would be funny. That Barnett taking you for a ghost and a running off, and then you and Corey getting Lee Buck to take him and his fiddling for the same thing. Don't be afraid now. Nothing's going to happen. I'm not afraid. Nothing will hurt me. But Chris, she caught his arm and clung to it. All that up there on the hill today was for you. I think that man is going to... He laughed silently as he always laughed when he laughed at all. Let him bring in the deputies. Outside of keeping Lee Buck cool, nothing much matters right now. It does matter, she whispered. He looked down into her upturned face and saw how near it was and seemed afraid and turned away. Now, this was an exciting chapter of the book. Now we know that we've answered the mystery or discovered the answer to the mystery of the fiddle. It was a real fiddle. Davy Cal, he's not just gone away. They've not took him away somewhere. He's been dead for six years. So that's what's wrong with Aunt Elgie. She's grieving and kind of lost her mind a little bit, grieving for her son and also grieving for his fiddle. She knows that whoever killed him took his fiddle. 
Um, so that solved one of our mysteries for us. Really interesting. I love the part about Pete playing in the mud. Um, I played in the mud a lot when I was a child. I liked to make mud pies and build roads and build houses and, and it sounded like what he was doing, especially if you had that much water. We used to try to find great big mud holes where there was a mud hole after a rain and we'd play in those and, and build little roads and, and, and different things. And when Corey and Katie was little, they liked to play in the mud too. I could give them, a, if, it, if there was no rain for the water, I could give them a five gallon bucket of water and they'd it'd entertain them for hours. So I could just picture Pete's uh, in the mud there building his lake. I really enjoyed that part. I like the part where her teacher, who knew she could be so bright, brave? I would never have been brave enough. I wouldn't have went in the cave in the last chapter, but I sure wouldn't have tried to find the, who was playing the fiddle. I would have been right behind Rye. I would have went right with her and Pete and went home. <clears throat> but when she's in the ivy bush, that ivy actually is mountain laurel. I have a video about my, mountain laurel. Uh, that we call ivy and then what people we call mountain laurel people call road it, it really is people don't just call it that is um, excuse my phone rhododendron um, so I'll link to that video and you can you can watch it and see that but I really love that she's using that that language that I grew up using calling uh, the mountain ivy calling it ivy I really enjoyed that part and just the fiddle overall the ghost fiddle uh, the fiddle is uh, beautiful music. I'm so glad that I have someone have Katie to play fiddle music for me and, and it just speaks to me in a really strong way. Uh, but it is eerie and you think about hearing it off in the distance on a cold, dreary day like it is today. Uh, this is the perfect day for me to read this chapter because it is fall of the year. It is cold, uh, cool, airish, as we'd say, in southern Appalachia. It's overcast and dreary and rainy, so it's exactly like the day that, um, that the author Arnaud is describing in this chapter. It's, it's really spot on. So I like, too, the part. It is funny, because um, now that we know that the fiddle was not a ghost. So Rye and Pete thought that it was a ghost fiddle. But at the same time, the Barnett man that had the fiddle, he thought Louisa was the ghost. I guess telling him he better give it back. You know, he better give it back to Aunt Elgie. So I liked that part too. But I hope that you'll leave a comment and tell me what jumped out at you in this chapter. What did you like? Are you glad that we found out one of the mysteries? Now we know uh, Davy Cal has been dead a long time. He's not going to go back to Aunt Elgie's, but hopefully she'll get the fiddle back. We'll have to read on to see that. So be sure to leave me a comment and let me know what you enjoyed. And be sure to drop back by so that we can find out what happens next in Mountain Path.